Our speaker, Colonel Hexra, is uh, a senior library software engineer at NVIDIA Rapids team. Uh, if you don't know, Rapids is a GPU-based analytics and data science library. He also works in uh, ESO C++ Canadian national body. And fun fact, his partner is actually from Wrocław. So welcome to our coal-powered city. <laughs> Uh, his talk is about better algorithm intuition. Please give him a round of applause. Thank you uh, for the introduction. Um, yes, yeah, so welcome to uh, Better Algorithm Intuition. As mentioned, or just mentioned, my name is Connor Hookstra. I go by uh, code underscore report on Twitter. And uh, just right off the top of this talk, um, if you find it easier to follow along on your laptop or on your cell phone, uh, you can go to either of the two links uh, listed here. So the one below is a tiny URL. That's tiny.cc slash 2QDLGZ. Uh, that's all in lowercase. Um, but note that if you are following along on your phone or on your laptop, uh, there are spoilers in this talk. So try to really pace with me and, and don't go ahead. And if you accidentally do go ahead, um, please refrain from answering uh, any of the questions in this talk, because that, that'll be cheating. Um, so, I like to start off each of my talks with the following quote. I'm not an expert, I'm just a dude, and that's from uh, Scott Schur, who gave a talk at CPPCon 2015. If you, if you have an answer for me, because I'm not an expert, I'm just a dude, uh, if you have an answer for me, or if you have questions, or whatever else, uh, not only do you get to ask your question or make your statement, but you also get chocolate. So I'm stealing the quote, and I'm also stealing the gimmick. So I might wait till the end if people are lining up or queuing for questions, because I don't think I can throw all the way to the back. Uh, but I have some uh, Polish candies here, uh, which are very delicious. So if you ask or answer a question, either during the presentation or at the end, uh, you will receive a uh, wobble candy. Um, so a little bit more about me. Uh, some of this was covered in the introduction. Um, I'm a senior library software engineer, and I work for NVIDIA. Uh, I work for a Rapids team, as mentioned. That's end-to-end uh, -end data science on the GPU. Very exciting. It's all open source. If you're interested in contributing or checking it out, go to rapids.ai. Um, I'm a programming language enthusiast, so uh, I primarily develop in C++, and I've been doing that for just over five years. But I also take interest in many other programming languages. Um, uh, I love auto. I'm in the AAA auto club. That's almost always auto. Um, I also prefer EastConst. I love algorithms, and I'm super excited to be here today talking to you about uh, the algorithms in the algorithm header. And I also have a YouTube channel where I solve uh, competitive programming problems uh, in a variety of languages, primarily in Java, C++, and Python. And I utilize different algorithms uh, in solving these problems. So if you're interested in, uh, in checking that out, uh, you can just Google Code Report on YouTube. So. Uh, I gave a prequel to this talk called Algorithm Intuition at both C++ Now and CppCon. Uh, if you haven't checked that out and you enjoyed this talk, uh, be sure to go check this out. I would recommend the C++ Now one. It's a little bit shorter, and I think it's the better version of the talk. Um, but in these two talks, I gave uh, a 10 to 15 minute motivation for why I'm giving this talk. I'm not going to go through that 10 to 15 minute motivation, but I'm going to give an abridged version. And it started with a talk that was given by Sean Parent in 2013 at a conference called Going Native and the title of the talk was C++ Seasoning. In that talk, he said, now famously, this. That's a rotate. And he proceeded to say it a few more times throughout that talk. That's a rotate. That's a rotate. That's a rotate. That's rotate the rotate. Rotate. A rotate, because rotate, rotate, rotate with rotate. Rotate, 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 rotate. Rotate, rotate, and rotate, rotate, and rotate. A rotate, rotate, and a rotate. Rotate is a very common operation. That's a rotate. So, as you can tell, Sean Parent's a big fan of rotate, but more importantly, he said in that talk the following. So you have all these algorithms at your disposal, right? Learn them. It's very important. So this was back in 2013, and this led to a wave of other individuals referring back to this talk and referencing this and talking about how you should learn those algorithms. That includes Marshall Clow, Kate Gregory, Odin Holmes, and Jonathan Bacara. Is using standard algorithms. Because he knows the algorithms. We need to know all the SCI algorithms. I should go look in algorithm. Learn your algorithms. And those clips combined with the following quote from a CPP cast episode, and Jason Turner's in the front row, one of the co-hosts of that podcast, motivated uh, this talk. And just as you can say, that would be a good use of a linked list. 
we don't have that intuition about algorithms yet, mm -hmm. and we need to. So all of that, combined with that clip, led to this talk, and the prequel to this talk. Uh, so the goal of this talk is to hopefully get you excited about algorithms, hopefully you'll learn a new algorithm, and hopefully to start to develop some intuition about these algorithms and how to use them for certain problems. Uh, so we're going to start with the prologue, and it's referring back to the, sequel, uh, the prequel to this talk, uh, where we covered the algorithms in the numeric header. So I showed this table where basically uh, we have the three uh, sort of algorithm headers, algorithm, numeric, and memory. And in the prequel talk, I covered algorithms that were in the numeric header. In this talk, we're going to be focusing on algorithms from the algorithm header. Note that there is 87 up to and including C++17. There's no way we're going to cover them all. I'm going to focus on about 20 to 25 of them, uh, but that's, it's good to know. And Note that there is 111 algorithms in total. And uh, recently at the uh, previous Belfast ISO meeting, uh, an individual by the name of uh, Vincent Riverdi plotted this really nice histogram, at least in my opinion, because I love algorithms, of the length of all of the algorithm names, so the number of characters in each algorithm. Um, and along with this, he also posted the following what I call Vincent list, which is basically the number of characters to the left of each algorithm name. And uh, importantly, what he said was that there was 114 algorithms in this list, which is not the same as the 111 that I counted. And I got really concerned because previously, I had sort of uh, disavowed what Jonathan Bacara said when he said that there was 105 algorithms in those three headers. And so I needed to make sure that it wasn't 114 and it was 111. And there are three algorithms in this list. There's no way you can read it, but I thought it was useful to point it out. Uh, lexical graphical three-way compare is a uh, C++20 algorithm. So the algorithms that I had posted are up to and including C++17. And then there's two algorithms here that are not in the algorithm numeric or memory headers, and that is uh, QSort and BSearch. Those are in the CSTUD lib headers. So uh, 111 up to and including C++17 uh, is definitely the case. And uh, there's another thing that I want to point out while we're talking about all the algorithms is that in a talk that Kate Grevery gave back at uh, CppCon 2019, uh, she said the following. There's a little algorithm header love club, which has had meetings this week, I have to say. And, you know, you know who we are. I heard this, and I was like, what? There's a little algorithm header love club. I love algorithms, and I'm not a part of this club. <laughs> so I went and looked, and sure enough, there is an algorithm love club. Um, <laughs> You, you can join at uh, Algo Love Club. They've got just over 100 followers, and um, you know their uh, handle is algo underscore love underscore club. If you love algorithms and you want to join the club, uh, know that it exists. I was extremely surprised when I, when I heard about this, seeing as I've given now this is my second talk on algorithms, and I had no, no idea this club existed. So if you're interested in joining, uh, you can follow there. So that brings us to chapter one. So uh, the first uh, two chapters and the fourth one are going to focus on leak code problems. So raise a hand. Who's familiar with LeetCode or have heard of it at least? That is about maybe 10% or less of the audience. So uh, LeetCode is a website that typically uh, students or um, individuals use to prepare for technical interviews for uh, large companies because they ask very similar questions in their interviews. Um, so I'm going to take a, a handful of problems from this website and uh, they're going to be solvable by STL algorithms in the algorithm header. Note that uh, for the first chapter, each of these is all solvable by a single algorithm. Uh, so these are supposed to be pretty easy. Uh, hopefully, uh, everyone's going to get them in the crowd. I'm going to show the problem. I'm going to read it. If you know the answer, just shout it out, and, and then we'll, we'll move on from there. So chapter one, reverse or write a function that reverses a string. So yes, I've heard 10 to 20 people yell out, stood reverse. And at this point, you might be thinking, wow, I went to the wrong talk. This is going to be extremely boring. Uh, I promise that it's going to get more exciting as the talk goes on. Oh, and I should also note that in the bottom left-hand corner over here, uh, you can see that the analog algorithms in the Thrust library, which is the STL library uh, for CUDA, sort of the similar as STL algorithm library is for uh, C++. Uh, so if you're interested in GPU uh, development, uh, you, know, you can look at the PDF for this, which is on my GitHub, and this will hyperlink you to the documentation for that. So getting back to the reverse problem, uh, you might be thinking this is very easy. Everyone probably knows this in the room. Why am I showing it? Well, for every leak code problem on that website, you have a forum where people get to post their solutions. And you can filter it by whatever language uh, you want. And so here I'm showing the top C++ solutions. Let's take a, cut, a look at a couple of them. This is the, the number one solution I'm about to show, 25,000 views for C++. <laughs> I'm not going to repeat a few of the things I heard from the crowd, but yes, 
Safe to say, this isn't what we would expect as the number one solution. Let's take a look at the next top solution. <laughs> Must be some trolling. I don't think so. I think people just are not aware of the STL algorithms. Let's take a look at another solution. Down to two lines, we're using std swap, similar to the first solution, so we're, we're getting closer. This next solution, I thought, here we go. This is going to be the one that uses std reverse. C++, one-liner. <laughs> For those that, you didn't, that didn't catch it, it's just the previous solution modified with the body on the same line as the for statement, or for loop. So, OK, getting further away. Um, and, and this was the solution when I finally saw it. I was like, OK, this is what I'm looking for. One line C++ code with the help of STL. They're explicitly stating we're using the STL here. So of course, this is going to be stood reverse, right? <laughs> A string constructor using reverse iterators. It's not, it's not terrible. Um, but definitely not what you expect. So the, the point I'm trying to show here is that even the simplest algorithms that all the C++ folks in the room know, uh, there's you know, for every one person in this room, I'm sure that there's, you know, insert number thousands uh, out in the wild that don't know about the simple algorithm. So I think it's worth reviewing the ones that we consider the simple ones. So uh, that brings us to our second problem. Implement a function to lowercase that has a string parameter str and returns the same string in lowercase. I heard it, uh, one person, most people said two lower, uh, but the out, that's not uh, specifically an algorithm. The algorithm we're looking for is uh, std transform with uh, two lower. Um, so yeah, this is pretty straightforward. Uh, you're basically just passing two iterators to define the range and an output uh, iterator, which is just going to be the same as the string uh, that we passed in with the first two iterators, and then the two lower is going to do uh, two lower for each character. Uh, next problem, or I think we're actually going to look at the Haskell solution here. Indeed we are. Uh, map is the equivalent of transform in Haskell. Uh, this doesn't really do anything for the crowd. I just love putting Haskell slides in my code because it makes me happy. Um, Haskell, yes. Woo! Uh, next problem. Uh, so problem number three, uh, sort array by parity. Given an array A of non-negative integers, return an array consisting of all of the even elements of A followed by all of the odd elements of A. You may return any answer that satisfies these conditions. So yeah, I've heard about you know, uh, 10 to 20 people once again. Uh, the algorithm that solves this exactly is std partition. Uh, so when you want to sort basically your array uh, or vector by a predicate, which is just a function that returns a Boolean, uh, you can just pass that as the third parameter here. So the first two parameters are iterators defining the range. And then our, our third parameter is a predicate in the form of a lambda here, checking whether uh, we have an even number. And so those will get put at the front. And a little uh, visualization of this algorithm is the following. So uh, you put basically a, an iterator or an index at the front of your array, and then you put one at the back. And then you're going to look for an element. So if we want to put all of the, the pink elements at the front, so we want to basically partition so that the pink are at the front, blue are at the back, we want to find uh, a block that fails to meet our predicate at the front and one that passes at the back, and then swap those and continue to do that. So uh, with the uh, iterator at the beginning of the array, we're going to look for a blue block. We're currently not at that, so we're going to step one to our blue block here. Uh, now we have a blue block, so we're going to go to the end. We're going to try and find a pink one. We're already at a pink one, so now we just swap these two. And we continue to do this. So once again, we find a blue one at the beginning. Then we want to find a pink one at the back. We swap these, and you're done. So this is going to be a linear runtime algorithm. Used to be my favorite algorithm before I discovered inner product slash transform reduce. If you're not familiar with those, go check out the prequel to this talk. Um, so. Uh, this is actually mentioned previously at Meeting C++. Uh, Ivan, or uh, Ivan uh, Chukic, uh, pointed out that this uh, implementation is something that's called the two-finger method, where basically you can put a finger here and a finger here and go boop, 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 boop. Um, so uh, he gave a fantastic talk. I believe it was called Compile Time Type Transformations. That'll be online in a couple months, and if you're watching this on YouTube, it probably already is online. Uh, I highly recommend going and checking out that talk. Uh, and this, once again, is the Haskell solution. Uh, note that uh, Haskell, their partition algorithm returns a, a tuple or a pair, so you have to sort of append those together to get the default behavior of the C++ STL um, partition. Uh, moving on to the next problem. Given an array nums, write a function to move all of the zeros to the end while maintaining the relative order of the non-zero elements. 
So I think all of the same people that yelled out partition just yelled out stable partition. So this is the exact same algorithm that we just saw, but as you saw from the implementation uh, visualization, you're not guaranteed that the relative order of the elements in each of the partitions are maintained. If you need that requirement, stable partition is the algorithm to reach for. Uh, so very nice. And uh, once again, this is the Haskell solution. Note that the default uh, uh, partition that uh, comes with Haskell is a stable partition, so nice to know. And last but not least for chapter one is the final problem number five, which is the most difficult of the five that we've looked at. So k closest point to origin. We have a list of points on the plane, uh, which is a Cartesian plane. Oh, whoops, I guess I did not add that. Um, and uh, find the k closest points to the origin uh, 0, 0. Here the distance between the two points on a plane is the Euclidean distance. Note that there's a couple different measures. We're uh, concerned with Euclidean, and that's sort of the Pythagorean uh, formula, if you're familiar with that. And you may return the answer in any order, uh, and the answer is guaranteed to be unique. Partial sort, so that is an algorithm that can solve it. And nth element is also one. So there's actually three algorithms that we can use to solve this. Uh, the first one is std sort. So we can just sort all the elements, um, and then we are going to pass it a basically a comparator in the form of a lambda that's calculating the Euclidean distances and then comparing them. And then at the end, with the return statement, we're just using a vector uh, to return the first k of those elements. So this is going to be an n log n solution, where n is the uh, number of elements in our array. But this is not optimal. As someone shouted out from the back, uh, we can do one better than this. But before we look at that algorithm, is there a small optimization without changing the algorithm that we can use to make this better? Yes, so we can drop the square roots because we're still maintaining uh, the comparator. So uh, there's a comment from the crown that the standard library function hypot is actually what we want to use here, uh, which I'm not familiar with, but um, I will check that out afterwards. Um, but this still definitely works. So uh, moving back to the uh, solution that was shouted out from the back of the crowd, uh, partial sort is actually uh, much better than what we had before here. So here we're just passing now a third iterator in between the uh, iterators that define the beginning and the end of our range, and it's only now going to sort basically the first uh, or the top k elements based on the comparator that you pass it. And so the only thing that's different between sort and the partial sort is that single iterator with the plus k, which is really, really nice. A and then as mentioned uh, by a few people in the crowd, uh, we can do one better than this with nth element. And note that the only thing we've changed there is the algorithm name, partial sort, nth element. So what are the two differences between this? nth element is a partial sort that basically gives you the top k elements, but not in sorted order. So if you have a partial sort and you're code reviewing, you should ask yourself, do I actually need these k elements at the top uh, to be sorted? If not, you can change uh, what I believe is a n log n worst case, but it's going to be like k log k in most cases for partial sort. You can change that to a linear runtime algorithm, which is fantastic. Um, so I think most C++ veterans know about this, but I've made this mistake uh, you know, in the last couple of years where I've written a partial sort, even tweeted it out, and then someone said, why are you using partial sort? You can use nth element, and then I you know, did a face palm, and yes. So very important to know. And that brings us to the first sort of relationship that I'm pointing out in this talk, is that when you have any of the first two, ask yourself if we need a full sort. If not, switch that to a partial sort, and then ask yourself, do we need those k elements partial sorted? If not, switch it to an nth element. So, uh, at this point, we are going to look at another clip from the same talk that we saw earlier from Kate Gregory, where she said the following. Partial sort copy, which does what it says on the tin. It gives you a copy, a smaller collection, that is just the things that would have been at the front, and it leaves your original collection in its original order. You don't want to sort your vector. This is not the right name for this. I'd like to see it called top end. I am delighted it is there. I wish it had another name. Do not tell me to write a paper. <laughs> so Kate Gregory is saying that partial sort copy has the wrong name. It's very unintuitive and it should be called top n. I don't agree. She explicitly said that we don't want to sort our elements. We just want the n top elements. What she's talking about is an algorithm that doesn't exist, nth element copy. What she's describing should be called top end sorted. And we've made this mistake before, where we've, we've had an out, we've had, well, this isn't an algorithm, it's actually a data structure that implicitly is sorted, and then it's led to the misnaming of another data structure. Map and set. By default, our map and set are sorted. 
And that's something that as C++ developers, we need to you know, cache in our brain. In Python, it is the opposite. Their set is by default a hash set because it doesn't have that extra sort of you know, piece of information that isn't there. And if you want a sorted set or a sorted map, you have to go to a different library uh, in the collections uh, called sorted collections, and it's called sorted set and sorted map. So um, I, I completely agree with uh, Kate Gregory with respect to one thing, and that is that naming is very hard, and that was the name of her talk. Um, so we've seen eight, uh, eight algorithms uh, so far up to this point, and uh, they're all listed here on the screen. Two of these don't rely on uh, std swap. Shout it out if you know the two. For each is one of them, and transform is the other one. So these six algorithms all rely on std swap. And so if you played this game with me uh, last night when we were out, uh, please refrain from answering. But if we switch for one of these algorithms, the std swap to a std move, and make one other minor change, we get another algorithm. Does anybody know which algorithm it is enlisted in pink and what's the resulting algorithm? All right, you can answer now, if you remember from last night. Remove if <laughs> and stable partition. So stable partition relies on std swap, and it basically puts elements that satisfy the predicate at the beginning and fail at the end. Remove if does the exact same thing, but instead of doing a swap, it does a move and leaves the elements at the end in an unspecified state. Uh, the only thing to note is that technically the elements that satisfy the predicate are the ones that are uh, you know, moved from and are left in an unspecified state. So you have to put like a not in front. Uh, but this is the second relationship. So if you have a stable partition and you actually don't care about the second partition, you can switch that to a remove if and uh, improve your performance. So this is a neat trick as well. Uh, so moving on to chapter two. These problems are all solvable by two STL algorithms. So we're upping the ante now. This is going to be a little bit more difficult. Uh, so our first problem, squares of a sorted array. Given an array integers a sorted in non-decreasing order, return an array of the squares of each number also sorted in non-decreasing order. You might be thinking this is very simple, but we have to look at the notes and note that number two says basically we can have values uh, between negative 10,000 and 10,000. The note here being that we could have negative values. So shout out if you know either one of the two or if you know both, you can shout them out to solve this problem. Transform is one of them and std sort is the other one. So, uh, yes, I had a comment from the front row. Could it be done quitter, quicker? There are a couple algorithms that uh, can be utilized to sort of do some merge and then not sorting the full array. Um, but for the purposes of this, we're just going to stick with this solution. So doing a std transform like we saw in the first chapter and then calling a sort at the end. So pretty straightforward. Moving on to the next problem. Uh, oh, actually, I've done this poll now, and this will be the last time I do this poll. Uh, who prefers... Uh, th so there are two different formats here where we have basically this uh, vertical uh, format and this horizontal format. And I've been checking with different audiences. Uh, so raise of hands if you prefer the first uh, vertical format. And hands down, who prefers this format? That was maybe two to one or three to two in favor of the vertical format. Uh, so I think across all the conferences that I've spoken at, uh, people have said, for at least for slideware, the vertical format is a bit more readable. But it was actually a trick question. Uh, you, not, you shouldn't have answered. Uh, this is the format you prefer. Uh, <laughs> it's the C++ 20 ranges. Uh, it's basically doing the same thing. And uh, in the future, once everyone's upgraded to C++ 20, we should all just be writing our code like this. Um, so yes, now, now moving on to the next problem after we look at the Haskell solution, uh, which is obviously much more short and beautiful and makes everybody happy. Um, so finally, uh, n repeated elements in a size 2n array. This is the original problem. Uh, previous times I've asked this, it's led to a lot of discussions, so I have simplified it uh, to element, element repeated once. Uh, and the problem states, in an array a of size n, there are n minus 1 unique values. Therefore, exactly one of those values appears twice. Return the value that is repeated two times. You only need to return it once. So what is the value that exists in this array that appears more than once? And note that this isn't a sequence. This isn't 1 to 10, and then we've duplicated one of those elements. This is just random values. So there's a mathematical trick you could use if what I just said was true, but that's not true. These are just random values. So two algorithms to solve this problem. Shout it out if you think you know one of them. Sort is one of them. And a JSON find by Jason from the front row uh, is the second algorithm that is correct. So 
If you sort, one of the properties of a sorted array is that all equal elements will be next to each other. And there's an algorithm called the JSON find that basically looks at adjacent pairs of elements and applies a binary predicate to those two elements and returns true if it satisfies that predicate. And the default binary operation that comes with a JSON find is std equal to. So out of the box, we can use a JSON find to solve this problem. Uh, so there's a comment from the back called why not use unordered set. Uh, I should have mentioned that we're looking for an in-place solution. And an unordered set would be more efficient. Uh, you would do it in linear time, but you would also be required to allocate. Uh, so it's a great point, but um, for the purposes of these problems, we're trying to do all of the algorithms in place. So moving on, uh, I think we have the Haskell solution here. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this, but it just it looks so beautiful. I think everybody agrees. Um, uh <laughs> so I believe this is the... Uh, the last uh, problem of this chapter, and it's one of my favorites of this talk. So it's a, a medium level problem, so getting a little bit more difficult. The problem is entitled, search in a rotated sorted array. So suppose an array sorted in ascending order is rotated at some po pivot point unknown to you beforehand. Uh, so note that if we start with 0, 1, 2, 4, 5, 6, 7, if you do a std rotate, I think at the fourth point, you end up with 4, 5, 6, 7, and then 0, 1, 2. So uh, we're going to simplify this for the next line. And basically, it's asking if uh, you find the target value that you're given, uh, return true, otherwise return false. And you may assume that there's no duplicates. And uh, the final requirement of this problem is that you need to have a log n solution in terms of time complexity. So I've heard rotate. I've heard lower bound. Lower bound is close. I heard adjacent find and sort. Those are both wrong. I heard the right one, which I'll state in a sec. And what do we do after? So the, well, I'll say it now. So the, uh, the first correct al algorithm is partition point. And what do we have to do after that? Binary search. Binary search. So before we look at partition point, which is probably an algorithm that people are less familiar with, as I was before uh, you know, preparing for this talk, um, we can solve this first in linear time using an algorithm called is sorted until. So that's going to give us the basically the point in our uh, partitioned uh, vector or array where it's been rotated at. And then once we have that point, we can do one of two binary searches, basically searching the first partition if we know our target value is greater than the first element, because then we know due to the fact that it was originally sorted, it's going to be in the first partition. Otherwise, do the binary search in the, uh, in the second partition. So that's what the last line does. Unfortunately, is sorted until is a linear runtime algorithm, at which point I typically say, does anybody know an algorithm that is, does this in log n for the problem here? And as stated by Mihao, this algorithm is partition point. So typically, people know at least three, maybe four, log n algorithms in the STL algorithm header, those being binary search, lower bound, upper bound, and the fourth one is equal range, which actually, if you were just in uh, Bjorn Fowler's talk, uh, he mentioned uh, two of those algorithms. Um, but there's a fifth log n algorithm that most people are unaware of, and that's partition point. So basically, it does the exact same thing, except it has a unary predicate, and it's looking for where the left element re returns true for the predicate, and the right element returns uh, false for two adjacent elements. So if you're in the first partition, both of them will return true. If you're in the second partition, both of them will return false. And at the partition point, you'll get one true, one false. So this is a really, really nice algorithm uh, to do basically finding a partition point of a partitioned algorithm. Um, so super, super nice. And uh, we can simplify this uh, lambda in the middle here. Uh, depending on your opinion, I'm not sure if this is simplified using std bind and std greater equal, um, which is really, really nice. And this code makes me extremely happy. So. Uh, partition point for the win. Remember, it is log n. Uh, chapter 3. So I'm going to talk even more about Haskell now, seeing as this is a C++ conference. Um, Haskell engineering. So we're going to talk about uh, how we can use ha Haskell to help us understand uh, you know, C++ better. And so this starts by uh, looking at the four horsemen of a user group that is in the Pacific Northwest of America uh, called the Northwest C++ User Group. And the four horsemen of this group, in my opinion, are the four individuals. So all four of these people used to attend this user group. So the first two are Andre Alexandrescu and Walter Braith, who are associated with which language? 
D language. So Walter Bright's the creator, and Andre Alexandrescu is one of the top contributors, maybe the top contributor now, I'm not sure. Eric Niebler is the third individual. He is the individual behind Ranges V3 and is helping you know, get Ranges into the standard. And the fourth individual is Bartosz Maluski. Bartosz Maluski used to be in the C++ Topia, uh, but now has migrated to uh, more be in Haskell and has written a very, very popular book called Category Theory for Programmers. And Bartosz Maluski uh, said on a podcast recently uh, the following. I All right. He didn't say it yet. Uh, so. First thing I'm going to show is a clip of Odin Holmes talking about people leaving uh, C++ to go to functional programming languages. I mean, I've seen this with my friends, too, this kind of behavior where as soon as they start dabbling in functional programming, they, they don't really come back, right? And, and the reason for this is obviously that the functional <laughs> programming community <laughs> have some really high drugs. <laughs> So I'm sure most of you know, as I've shown it, shown it previously, this is the Haskell logo. Um, and, and Bartaj has given a, a ton of talks at this same conference in previous years uh, that basically talk about uh, you know, category theory and sort of putting Haskell-esque stuff in C++. Uh, so this is a quote from uh, one of the podcasts that I just, uh, or, or so this is a quote from Odin Holmes saying, as soon as they dabble in functional programming, they never come back. Um, and this is the list of the talks that Bartosz has given. I highly recommend you guys go check this out if you're interested in functional programming and are a C++ developer. And now is the quote by uh, Bartosz Maluski from the podcast that I recently listened to. It's a way, so understanding functional programming was like a, a shortcut for you to be able to understand template metaprogram. Yes, like yeah. Being able to think in Haskell, but write in C++ was your advantage. Yeah, and then I even started talking to C++ programmers saying that even if you program in C++, it's a good idea to learn some Haskell. And then a couple, second later, a couple seconds later, he said this. If, if you solve your problem first in Haskell and then uh, you translate it into C++, you will probably get better quality code. So I'm not sure... I completely agree with that in all cases. If you write something in Haskell and then you know, translate it into C++, you're going to end up with higher quality code. But I do think that the exercise is, is, is very valuable and that you can learn things and have insights about STL algorithms and other things in C++ by doing this. So that's exactly what we're going to do. Um, this is a problem that I showed in the prequel to this talk. I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. If you're interested in sort of the full-blown solution and how I walk from an imperative solution to a STL algorithm solution, refer back to the original talk. But very quickly, uh, this problem states the following. So it's entitled Trapping Rainwater, and it says, given n non-negative integers representing an elevation map where the width of each bar is 1, compute how much water it is able to trap after raining. So if you treat each of the black bars basically defining a mountainous range and remove the blue, the question is asking, if it were to rain, how much water would this mountainous range catch? And originally I show the imperative solution, but this is the algorithm solution. And the idea is basically that you are first identifying where the maximum is, and then you're going to do something called a max scan from the left and a max scan from the right. So scan in C++17 is an algorithm called inclusive scan. In C++11, it's called partial sum. So basically, in partial sum, you're calculating the partial sums at each point in time of all of the elements from the start of your range to the current index that you're at. But you can overload the binary operation that comes with partial sum, which is plus, to be anything that is a binary operation. So in this case, we're using uh, UFO max, um, which is basically going to then give you the partial max at each point in time up until the maximum. So once you've done this and you have your sort of scan max array, this is going to define this black and blue range. So once we have that range, if we just subtract the original range, the black from it, we're going to be left with the blue. So that involves first taking the max element, then doing two inclusive scans, one from the left to the maximum, and then one from the right to the maximum, which we're doing that with reverse iterators. And then we do a transform reduce at the end to basically take the difference between these two uh, ranges with the std minus, that's our transformation binary operation, and then we do a reduction to add all the blues up to get a single number. Um, so if I went through that really quickly and you're thinking that was extremely confusing, the point of this problem isn't to understand the solutions. Like I said, look back to my prequel talk if you want to understand this better. The point here is to just note what are the three algorithms that we're using to solve this problem. Max element, inclusive scan, and transform reduce. So remember those three algorithms. Now we're going to look at the Haskell solution and compare uh, the algorithms that we use in the Haskell solution to these three algorithms. So here is the beginning of our Haskell solution. The first thing that we need to do is to find the maximum of our range. 
We're going to just do that by calling an algorithm called maximum. Fantastic. Then we're going to find the index of this maximum using a length and take while. Then we're going to split our uh, array into basically two partitions. We're going to do that with a take i, which is taking the first i elements, and then doing a drop i, which is dropping the first i elements. And then we add those two together while doing a scan from the left to the max, and then a scan from the right to the max, and that gives us y. So y s is our basically black plus blue, and x is is just our black. So now what we have to do is just subtract those two, and we do that with a zip width minus, and then we add all those up with a sum. So once again, you might be thinking, this is extremely confusing. I don't understand this at all. That's OK. I'm assuming most people aren't you know, Haskell enthusiasts here. Or actually, raise a hand. Who is, considers themselves a Haskell novice? I see like three or four hands. So uh, yes, most people aren't here. But once again, what we're trying to compare here is just the names of the algorithms. So uh, there's a couple optimizations we can do first. If we uh, want to do a take and a drop, there's an algorithm called split at that basically does, the, uh, does the exactly that. And pattern matching is built into the language here. So we can split A and B uh, right at the point when we call split at, which is wonderful. And we can now combine split at and take while into an algorithm called break which is fantastic. So you end up with this really, really concise, beautiful piece of code, in my opinion. And at this point, we're going to compare the C++ STL algorithms to the algorithms that we see on screen here. So first, we're going to start with inclusive scan. Everyone can probably point out where the inclusive scans are, the scan L and the scan R on the bottom. Um, so you can see here, these, are, these basically uh, parody what we saw in the C++ solution. The next al algorithm that we're going to try and find is max element. I'm sure everyone, once again, can point this out as maximum. But now we're left with transform reduce. And so I've heard some zip. So there is no single algorithm on the board or on the screen that basically matches our transform reduce. But what is transform reduce? It's just a composition of two algorithms. One's a reduce, and one's a transform. So can anyone point out what algorithm is the reduce? Some. And that leaves us with transform. But previously, I said that the equivalent of transform in Haskell was map. So how could that be the case? So these are the two type signatures of zip width and map. Uh, we can sort of align these a bit, align them a bit more, switch the colors, and uh, What we're showing here is that C at the end is the return type for our function. So we have uh, this a type signature is what they call it in uh, Haskell. It's the equivalent of a function declaration in C++. And for map, we have a single unary operation and a list of A as our parameters, and we end up with a list of Cs. And for zip width, we have a binary operation that takes an A and a B and gives you a C, and then takes two ranges, A and B, and gives you a C. Both of these are std transform in C++. And I think this is incredibly important to, to cash in your brain. If you've seen Jonathan Bacara's talk, 105 algorithms in an hour, he sort of mentions this, that the two-range version of transform is often neglected. And I completely agree. And in other languages, they don't call them the same thing. They're completely different things, because in the two-range version, there's an implicit zip, which I've talked about previously in my prequel talk, where not calling out the fact that there's an, a zip in an algorithm a lot of the times leads to people uh, misappreciating it or underappreciating it. Um, so the point here is cash in your head. std transform uh, is both map and zip width in functional programming languages. And if you can cache this in your head, you'll start to use std transform a lot more often. Uh, so that brings us to chapter four. We're going back to leak code. Um, and I believe the first thing in this chapter that I'm going to point out is uh, not attached to a problem because uh, I wanted to reduce the amount of time of this talk. Um, but it's the following thing here, that if you have a find if, you can upgrade this to a lower bound or an upper bound. And once again, if you were just in Bjorn Fowler's talk, uh, he did this exact thing where he showed a find if and then pointed out, oh, wait, we have uh, elements that are sorted. So we can actually use a lower bound or upper bound here. And this was also mentioned by Sean Parent in his C++ seasoning talk. That's a find if. Maybe, you might think, implies that this stuff is sorted. Well, if you read the actual function, you would find that, yes, in fact, everything except for the item we're looking for is in sorted order. And now we can replace the find if with a lower bound, and we can do a binary search for that guy. So incredibly important. Another thing to add to your code review of algorithms, if you see a find if, ask yourself, 
is this a sorted array or a descending array or sorted by some sort of comparator? If so, you can replace your find if and go from linear time to uh, log n time, which is fantastic. So this brings us to the only problem of this chapter, and it's by far my favorite from the talk, and it's actually pretty simple. So it's entitled reverse only letters, and it says, given a string s, return the reverse string where all characters that are not a letter stay in the same place, but all the letters are reversed in their positions. So uh, this is a little bit you know, compl uh, complicated to visualize if you don't have an example. So this is the example. We're given 1ab, 2cd, and note that the 1 and the 2, because they're not alphabetic letters, stay in their same positions, but the a, b, c, d are reversed, so you end up with dc and ba. So the question I'm going to ask is how many algorithms do you think we need to solve this? Chapter 1 was 1, chapter 2 is 2. I'm not saying anything about the pattern here. So we're going to go through, raise of hands, who thinks you can solve this with one algorithm? Zero hands. Uh, who thinks you can solve this with two? I see about 10 to 20. Who thinks you can solve this with three? Probably less than that. Or maybe it was 10, 10 or so. And then who thinks you can solve this with four? <laughs> I see zero. So we only had votes for two and three, and most people uh, are not voting. So um, I guess they just want to wait and see. So we're going to start with three. Uh, so shout out if you think you have one of the three algorithms that can be used uh, to solve this. Uh, no and no. Reverse is one of them. And copy if is one of them. And std transform is the other one. So basically what we do is we do a copy if it's a letter. And then we put that in a string called letters. Then we do a reverse of that string letters. And then we do a transform where basically we, we loop over or map over our uh, original string. And any time we encounter a letter, you do a copy from our, stri our string letters. And then we just increment basically an iterator that's pointing at the current uh, letter in our string letters. And then we continue to move that along every single time we visit a letter. So basically, we're, we're copying all the letters, reversing them, and then copying them back into our original string uh, in order to get our result. So does anybody know? how we can remove one of the three algorithms on the screen in order to do the exact same thing that we're currently doing. Which, which algorithm can we remove? Yes, we can remove uh, reverse and then basically just do copy if with reverse iterators. So now we're down to two algorithms. So if you said three, unfortunately, you're incorrect. But can we get down to one? Does anybody know an algorithm that currently isn't in the STL algorithm header that we could use to solve this in a single line? Close. It's an if, but even less generic than transform if, what we want yep. is reverse if. <laughs> Unfortunately, we don't have this algorithm. But I thought, oh, we're giving a talk. Let's go and you know, implement a very naive, incorrect version of this and, and see if we can get the, the correct behavior for at least the, the test samples that were on this website. So a, a sample implementation might be the following. Note, I'm not asking to point out bugs. There's tons of bugs on this screen. Uh, this is just supposed to be illustrative to how this algorithm might work. So you have uh, two iterators, one at the beginning, one at the end. And you're going to have an outer while loop that basically, while these two iterators are not pointing to each other, uh, you continue. And then you have two inner while loops uh, that basically, at the beginning, are checking you know, while we're not pointing to a letter, continue to iterate. And then we do the exact same thing at the end while we're not pointing to a letter uh, decrement. And then we just swap those two uh, once we find them. Um, and we continue to do this until the outer while loop uh, exits. Um, so a, a more you know, correct version, but still incorrect, uh, is the following algorithm. Um, but the point I want to make here, or the question I want to ask, is who knows an algorithm who has a very simple or similar implementation compared to this? I heard it. Make sure you come and get a candy afterwards. Partition. So we saw this visualization earlier. Two iterators, and basically we're trying to find a blue and a pink and then swap them. So blue at the beginning, pink at the end, and then swap them. For this algorithm, we want to do almost the exact same thing. But instead of finding a blue at the beginning and a pink at the end, we want to find two blue elements and then swap those. Um, so basically, 
Here, we're finding two elements that satisfy the predicate we're looking for, and then swap them. So here, we step once, we step once again, and then we swap. We continue to do this, we find a blue at the back, swap these, and then we're done. And then at this point, we have reversed all of the letters or the, the elements that satisfy our predicate uh, for our algorithm. So can we use std partition to solve this problem? The answer is yes. So here in our lambda, we're basically capturing and initializing a Boolean flag, b, equal to true. And then any time we start at the front, any time we get an element that then satisfies that predicate, we then toggle that Boolean so that when we go to the back, we're basically putting a not in front of the predicate. Isn't that fantastic? <laughs> and I went and checked this. I actually submitted this code on LeetCode, and it worked. It passed. Um, I'm not sure I would recommend this code, because <laughs> it, it, it basically relies on the implementation of partition being exactly what I showed. If it's anything different, it's going to break. But MSVC and I believe uh, Clang both do it this way. So um, yeah, wouldn't write this code. But it's an interesting trick um, to note that not just by sort of the names and the behavior, but also by the implementations can we draw dotted lines between algorithms. It's very, very neat. And this made me extremely happy when I discovered it. I went on like a you know hour jog and had to you know burn off my excitement because it was it was so awesome. Um, so I mean, I, I partitioned up the whole that's fantastic. So the comment from the crowd was, I would also expect thrust partition to work. Oh, it, that it would not work. That's not that's the opposite of fantastic. Then. <laughs> that's true. Yes. It, yes. Uh, so the comment from the crowd is that it's a parallelized, ver parallelized version, so obviously it doesn't have the same implementation. Um, so nobody was correct, because nobody said one. Uh, in the past, I think one and a half people were correct at meeting C++, but yes. Awesome observation. So last but not least, the final chapter of this talk is the Sean Parent game. Um, so this is uh, super fun. It's a play along. Uh, so basically the way it's going to work is I'm going to throw an algorithm up on the board, and you guys have to shout out, or everybody here has to shout out, uh, which algorithm we can use to implement this one algorithm. So does anybody know what algorithm that's very similar to is sorted that we can use to implement is sorted? Yes, so I heard mostly a different algorithm, which we're going to talk about just in a sec. Uh, but the one that I'm looking for is is sorted until. Um, so is sorted until gives you the element that you know uh, is no longer in sorted order. And so if we are returning basically the past the last uh, element iterator, we know that our whole array or vector or data structure is sorted. Um, and if we go and check uh, the MSVC implementation of is sorted, uh, there's a lot of noise here. But the only thing I'm pointing out is that, sure enough, uh, is sorted is implemented in terms of is sorted until. So that's a very nice thing to know. Um, so coming back to is sorted until, a bunch of you just sh uh, shouted out, uh, what's an algorithm that we can use to implement this? Adjacent find, yes. So a bunch of uh, everyone, or a bunch of people previously just shouted this out. So we can use adjacent find to implement is sorted until. So note that we covered this before. It looks at adjacent elements. If we overload the binary operation to be uh, less than or equal to, uh, we then can basically get the same behavior as is sorted until. And I believe I have a couple implementations from MSVC of is sorted until up on the board. And then next is adjacent find. Note that uh, is sorted until is not implemented in terms of adjacent find. Uh, but this is toggling between them. <laughs> they're very, very similar. They're not identical, but they're very similar. So let's, let's do a diff. So on the first line, it's just the algorithm name, so we can ignore that. On the third line, it is just a comment, so we can ignore that too. On the very last line, it's just basically doing an assignment that is using different variable names, so we can ignore that one as well. And then on the uh, third from the bottom, it's just incrementing a little bit differently. So the only line that's actually different is the one that's comparing the predicate. And it's a bit hard to see, but the only difference is the order of which the elements are passed to this binary predicate. So basically, you can implement is sorted until exactly in terms of adjacent find, but just by flipping the order in which the elements 
where the arguments are passed to the binary predicate. And we can make use of this really nifty flip function from the Boost HANA library that was uh, written by Louis Dion, who I believe uh, uh, Mathieu um, also called out previously in his talk uh, at CodeDive. Um, so this is super, super nice, and uh, it's, an, it's a neat trick. So we're back, and this is where it gets fun. Does anybody in the crowd know an algorithm that we can use to implement adjacent find? And the reason it's called the Sean Parent game, Sean Parent went straight from is sorted until to this algorithm. It's not rotate. <laughs> and I also want to call out, when I was at meeting C++ last week, this individual has been the first person to go from adjacent find to this algorithm. So still not at the Sean Parent level, but he's the only person that I've spoken to that has, has been able to get this algorithm. And in my opinion, these are his, uh, he's the founder of the uh, Italian C++ community and the corresponding conference, and he has a blog where he talks about tons of algorithms, and he had a whole, arg uh, a whole article on this algorithm, which is what leads me to believe that he was able to get this. Um, so, so find if is close. Um, And the one other thing I'll add is, I, or I might have said this before, this is, in my opinion, the worst named algorithm across all of memory, algorithm, and numeric. Uh, is there an inner product? You're getting close. So inner product was another guess that was close. So the, the part that makes inner product close is that it combines two ranges. The part that makes find if close is that it short circuits. Stood mismatch. So stood mismatch is an algorithm that takes two ranges, returns you a pair of iterators to the first pair of elements that satisfy or fail to satisfy the binary predicate that you um, provide it with. And by default, stood mismatch is given equal to. So here, we're going to look at the first two elements. They're equal. Second two are still equal. Third two are still equal. And then the fourth are not equal. So it's going to return you a pair of iterators pointing to these two elements. And so in order to implement adjacent find, we can basically do the same zip tail trick where we pass it the 0 to n minus 1 and 1 to n elements so that you're comparing adjacent elements. And that's all you need to do. And I originally wrote this code at my local meetup. And then Michael Park, a uh, fellow Canadian, pointed out that in C17 we added a function to do exactly what we're doing here. So all we're doing is basically applying a not to the predicate that we, we were passed in. And so we can just use std not fun, which does this exact thing. So then we end up with this extremely beautiful code. Um, so Michael Park, thank you for pointing that out. I think this algorithm should be called zip fine. Technically, std mismatch is zip fine not. There is a, there's a not inside, but if we take that not outside, and then we could just implement std mismatch in terms of zip find by doing the exact trick that we just saw. Some people might argue that we should call this transform find because we want to you know, maintain parity with our transform and transform reduce algorithms. Uh, but I would argue that the transform find that takes a single range isn't really that useful. You can do that with find if. Um, and that we should just leave it called zip find and it only takes two ranges. Um, so a sample implementation of zip find would be the following. Um, or sam sample implementation of mismatch in terms of zip find would be the following, where here we're now applying the not fun C17 function. And then we could uh, implement adjacent find in terms of zip find, where we don't need to do any of the sort of double negating in order to get the behavior we want. And so note that for adjacent find, we don't want to return a pair of iterators. We only want to return the first of the two iterators, which is a super, super neat trick. And so I went and took a look, or sorry, we're going to talk about the uh, algorithms that all. Um, have these implicit zips. So we just talked about mismatch. There are three other algorithms that uh, one of them I mentioned previously and the Haskell solution and a couple others. So shout it out if you know the algorithms that have an implicit zip. So transform, yes, that is the zip width. Inner product and transform reduce. These, at least for the two range versions, can be thought of as zip reduce. And there's a fourth one. I count inner product and transform reduce as the same equal, 
which takes two ranges and just returns you a Boolean on whether they're equal to or not. You could implement this in terms of zip reduce with a logical AND for your reduction and an equal to for your transformation. But I actually went and checked to see how is equal implemented. Um, this is the MSVC. They're not implementing it in terms of anything. But I did find this implementation that implements equal in terms of mismatch, which is not what I had initially. I thought it's the transform reduce that we wanted. But this individual implemented equal in terms of mismatch. Any guesses who this individual was? What was that? Nope, not STL. Alexander Stepanov. For those of you that don't know, he is the father of STL and the original implementer. So very neat piece of knowledge. Um, note that he didn't do it vertically. This is how he implemented it. This is my sort of formatting. Um, but yes, so equal can actually be implemented in terms of this, mismatched, checking whether the iterators are pointing to the end of the ranges. And there's several other uh, algorithms here that all take two ranges, but they're not implicitly doing zips, so try not to get those confused. And uh, yes, mismatch, in my opinion, it's the worst named STL algorithm. The second worst is adjacent difference, which I think should be called adjacent transform. And uh, these are all the algorithms that we've covered in the last hour here. Um, note that there's a few of them that are grayed out. There's a 90-minute version of this talk that I might give at some point, which covers the other ones. And yes, last but not least is the conclusion. So in chapter one, we cover the relationship between sort, partial sort, and nth element, and remove if and stable partition. In chapter two, we recovered the relationship between uh, is sorted until and partition point, and pointed out that partition point is the fifth and uh, log n algorithm. Uh, for chapter three, I pointed out that transform is both zip width and map in functional programming languages, which I think is important to cache. In chapter four, I covered how you can upgrade find if to lower bound and upper bound, and how partition can be used to implement reverse if, asterisks don't really do it. And in chapter five, the relationship between is sorted, is sorted until, adjacent find, and mismatch. And last but not least, uh, for those of you that are from Vroslav, you might have recognized that on each of my chapter title slides, I had these little photos. Those are all from uh, Vroslav. Um, so if you're not local from here and you have a couple extra days to check out the Christmas market, I highly recommend uh, going and checking out Vroslav because it's an extremely beautiful city. Thank you.